Welcome to the FAA Production Studios and the FAA Safety Center, the National Resource Center located in uh, the Sun and Fun Complex in beautiful Lakeland, Florida. I'm your host, Walt Schammel, and our next presenter has been an aircraft maintenance technician for over 20 years. He's been with the FAA over four years, and he's currently the FAA Safety Program Manager for the Minneapolis FISDO. His topic today, and a very appropriate one for today's environment, is owner-operator responsibilities in aircraft maintenance. Let's welcome James Niehoff. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? This uh, presentation is one that I put together a while ago. It is my favorite presentation. It's got a lot of good information in it, in my opinion. I always get a lot of good feedback from it. We're not going to be talking about what you can and cannot do maintenance-wise on your aircraft as an owner-operator. We're going to be talking about your responsibilities for the maintenance of your aircraft. My name is Jim Niehoff, and I like to tell everybody a little bit about myself before I get started to make sure you know where I came from and how I came to be talking to you today. I actually started my career down here in Florida. Anybody from Florida? You're from elsewhere? South Central Florida, Palm Beach County Glades Airport, 1982. I came to work down here as an A&P mechanic. Worked on single engine light twin for six years. Went back to Minnesota, my home state, in 1988. Went to work for a company called Whip Air Incorporated. Anybody hear of Whip Air before? World's largest manufacturer of floats for aircraft. Exciting place to work. Worked on a lot of nice stuff, new stuff different stuff, stuff that uh, other folks in the industry weren't working on very much, and it was very challenging and very exciting. Last five years there, I was the chief inspector of the repair station, and uh, I guess I can tell you that the day I took the chief inspector job at Whip Air was the day the clock started ticking. Uh, it was a very high-paced, high-stress environment. I averaged anywhere from 100 to 120 337s a year. That is a major repair and major alteration form give you an idea of the volume of work that was going through the shop at the time. After five years in that uh, position, I had reached a state of burnout and was looking for someplace else to go. So in May of 2003, I crossed over to the dark side and went to work for the FAA. I was a principal maintenance inspector in the GA unit at the Minneapolis FISDO for four years. Uh, and then a year ago, December, went to work for the FAA safety team. And that's uh, gives me an opportunity to put presentations like this together and talk to you folks about important issues. Today I'm going to be talking about owner-operator responsibilities in aircraft maintenance and, time permitting, I'm going to spend a brief period of time on TSOs and PMAs, which are FAA approved parts that get installed on your aircraft. I'm going to tell you what they are and how you get them put on your aircraft. And at the very end, when I initially put this presentation together, my supervisor wanted an outline. And so I put an outline together for her, and at the very last note, the very last bullet point on my outline was a personal note from me to the audience. And when she read that, she signaled me, come on in here, I want to talk to you about this. And I told her what I was going to talk about, and she gave me the thumbs up, and I've been doing it ever since. So to start, your responsibilities start at the Airworthiness within certificate. Have you ever read one? Anybody ever read one? Really? This, this is one of those typical things where the large print giveth and the small print taketh away. Your responsibilities for maintaining and operating your aircraft are contained on its airworthiness certificate. Before I go any farther, I want to talk about the word airworthy. We use this term every day in this business. Anybody here not use the word airworthy? Do we know what it means? Anybody tell me what is the definition of airworthy. When your mechanic performs the annual inspection on your aircraft and signs it off at the bottom stating, I certify this aircraft has been inspected in accordance with an annual inspection and determined to be airworthy, what is your mechanic stating? First part of that definition, when your aircraft conforms to its type design or properly altered condition, and those are my words, and this is out of 14 CFR Part 3, Section 3.5, and the aircraft is in a condition for safe operation. No subjectivity in the first half, lots of subjectivity in the last half. What I mean when, or properly altered condition, what do those words mean? 
A lot of times aircraft are altered at some point during the course of their life. In my industry career, I altered a lot of aircraft. I put a lot of floats on. I did a lot of alterations, right-hand doors, larger engines, Robertson stall kits, flint tip tanks, the list goes on and on and on. Every time a major alteration is performed on an aircraft, it must be tied back to the type design with approved data. And that is a, uh, either some sort of approved data, either a type certificate or engineering order or something like that. So the aircraft can actually be altered from its original design the way it was like when it left the factory and still conform to its type design through approved data. So this is the definition. And uh, again, even though I worked in the industry for 20 years, and this is a favorite question for me to ask in, when I do maintenance presentations because I like to see how many of the me mechanics out in the audience know the definition to airworthy. I was working to this definition for 20 years even though I couldn't tell you what that definition was. So it's always an interesting thing to note. So here's your airworthiness certificate. And there's a lot of information contained on here. Up here in the upper left hand corner you see the nationality and registration marks. What is the nationality mark on an aircraft registered in the United States of America? Anybody know? Anne. Very good. Thank you. Anne. How about Canada? What do you see on Canadian airplanes? What's the uh, registration mark? C. All right. Does anybody know what the registration mark for an aircraft is in the Maldives? Every, every, every uh, uh, nation in the world that has a CAA or a Civil Aviation Authority where you can register an aircraft has their own nationality mark. And uh, I have actually a list back at the office, it's quite interesting. So that's the nationality mark, and what follows is the registration numbers and letters in some combination thereof. You'll find the manufacturer and model number on your airworthiness certificate, as well as the serial number. This is the information that ties this document to your aircraft. You'll also find the category. I would wager to guess uh, anybody flying experimental amateur built here, you're not going to see one of these in there. That's yours. Um, anybody know where you go to find the category? If you wanted to know what the category of your aircraft was, where would you go to find that information? It's on the type, it's on the type certificate data sheet. If you haven't read the type certificate data sheet for your aircraft, I would suggest that you do that. It's very interesting. It's got a lot of information, at least from a mechanic's point of view. It's very interesting. It basically tells everything that's supposed to be on your aircraft. It'll give you the engine that you can put on it, the prop combinations. All of that information is contained. It tells you the category, tells you the certification basis, and a lot of other information. Then we have the authority and basis for issuance block. And if there are any exceptions to this, that's where they will be typed. Uh, my guess is that most, if not probably 99% of everybody, has a, has a none, the word none, typed in this particular box. You do find exceptions to this rule from time to time. And uh, if you get into the business jet category of aircraft, that's a lot of times you'll find it there or larger. A lot of times there are exceptions to the rules. That's where they will be. The date of issuance of the airworthiness certificate, the representative who's issuing that certificate, whether it be FAA or a, a DAR or whoever, and their designation number. All right, now that we've flipped past that and you've had a chance to look at it, did anybody notice what three rules are referenced on the airworthiness certificate. There's three rules that are spelled out. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But for now, we're going to go through line by line the authority and basis for issuance section of the airworthiness certificate. And we're going to, I'm going to explain a little bit of this as we go. It states the following. This airworthiness certificate is issued pursuant to the Federal Aviation Act of 1958. This is the legislation that was passed by Congress and signed by the President of the United States that created the FAA. Prior to that, we were the CAA. The FAA officially came into existence in 1958 and certifies that, as of the date of issuance, the aircraft to which issued has been inspected and found to conform to the type certificate, therefore, to be in condition for safe operation. What is that? Anybody make the connection here? That is the, the, that is the definition of airworthy. airworthy. Thank you. So the aircraft must be determined to be airworthy prior to the issuance of an airworthiness certificate. And we'll continue on. And has been shown to meet the requirements of the applicable comprehensive and detailed airworthiness code as provided in Annex 8 of the Convention 
of uh, international civil aviation except as noted herein. And again, if there's any exceptions to this, you would find them here. So every time an initial issuance of this certificate is made, the aircraft must be determined to be in an airworthy condition. Subsequent issuance or reissuances of this certificate can be done based on the issuance of this initially. When I would issue replacement certificates, and if you would ever get in a position where you would need one, whether you change the end number on your airplane or the old certificate got deteriorated to the point where you couldn't read it or it was torn and you wanted a replacement, that's something that routinely happens at the FISDO. Probably a couple of times a week I was issuing a, a replacement airworthy certificate for one reason or another. I do not need to make a determination of airworthy to reissue, but a determination of airworthy must be made for an initial issuance of this certificate. Terms and conditions. Another section on the airworthy certificate that contains lots of words, and we're going to go through these. And there are the three rules that are referenced. Anybody want to make a guess again as to what three rules are referenced in this particular section? One of them I would uh, I rarely is guessed. It's part 21. But the other two, anybody know the, the, the rule for maintenance? As a mechanic, what rule do I follow to do, do the maintenance on the aircraft? It's part 43. What's the rule that you need to know to operate your aircraft? Where, where do you find the minimum safe altitude rules and that sort of thing? Anybody want to make a guess? It's 91. So let's go through this line by line. I'll explain a little bit of this as we go. And it starts like this. Unless sooner surrendered, suspended, revoked, or a termination date is otherwise established by the administrator. And there was a day when every airworthiness certificate that was issued had an expiration date on it. It was only good for one year. At the end of that year, an, air, an annual inspection needed to be accomplished on the aircraft. A new determination of airworthy needed to be made, and at that point in time, a new airworthiness certificate was issued good for one year. That changed in the mid-50s, 1955, when, as you can imagine, with the number of aircraft ex escalating, over time, it got to be a huge burden to be issuing a new one of these for every single aircraft. So at that point in time, no termination date was placed on the certificate. However, from time to time, old aircraft that did have a, an expiration date on there over the certificate come to the FISDO to get a replacement. And a determination, since it's never had one since 1955 because it expired at that point in time, a new determination of airworthy needed to be made at that point in time before I could issue a new one. And we'll continue, this airworthiness certificate is effective as long as the maintenance, preventive maintenance, and alterations are performed in accordance with Part 21, 43, and 91. Those are the three rules referenced, and right here, it, it all, if you can imagine, uh, we live under a representative democracy, or at least that's what I will call it today, and, and we have a Congress and a, uh, uh, that, that passed legislation creating the FAA, a president that signed that legislation, giving us the authority to write and to regulate these particular rules. We, who, who elect to get involved in aviation, voluntarily submit ourselves to these rules. So at this point in time, this is our, this is our connection to those rules. This is what is telling us, how, the FAA, the authority we have to issue the certificate, and you, how you as an owner-operator, are going to maintain and operate your aircraft all come from this particular point. And let's continue. There's another really important point that, uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of. So we're going to uh, maintain our aircraft in accordance with Part 40, uh, 21, 43, and 91 of the FARs as appropriate and the aircraft is registered in the United States. That needs to be all capitals on that and. The aircraft must have a valid registration. The status of the airworthiness certificate is the same as the status of the registration. If the status of your registration goes from valid to anything other than valid, your airworthiness certificate has that same status. Are you all owners in here? Are you, you own your aircraft? So every three years, you get a postcard from Oklahoma City, right? Remember seeing that? And uh, this goes out to every aircraft owner every three years. If the information, if this, first of all, if the card reaches you, and all the information is correct, you take that card and you can throw it away. Nothing changes. If you have moved and you have not updated your information with the registration in Oklahoma City and this card is mailed to you, doesn't find you, 
and is returned to Oklahoma City, the status for your registration will be changed from valid to undeliverable triennial. At that point in time, you do not have a valid registration and you do not have a valid airworthiness certificate in your aircraft. There are other reasons. Uh, it could be terminated. I'm not sure exactly how long it can stay in the undeliverable triennial status before it changes to terminated, but there are a number of variety of reasons why your registration can be changed from valid to something else. If you want to check, if you're curious, Google your end number. Go to the FAA.gov FAA website and check the status. Do an end number search for your aircraft. It's all public information and your name and your address will be on there and the status of your registration will be there. So if you're curious, I would urge you to have a look and see what your status is. If I were, if you were to come to me at the FISDO requesting a replacement airworthiness certificate for whatever reason, lost it, new end number, what have you, the first thing I would do is check the status of your registration. If the status is anything other than valid, I can't help you until that is fixed. Let me tell you one other thing, um, and you may want to take notes on this or at least store it away back in the gray matter. There is a way, if there is a problem, if the status of your registration is anything other than valid and you want to go flying that day, it's still possible. Call Oklahoma City up, see what they need to fix this. It may, you may be able to do it on the phone right there, you may not. If you can't do it on the phone right there and they need additional information, make sure before you let them off the phone that they give you what's called a fly-by-wire. A fly-by-wire. And don't, uh, if they don't know what you're talking about, just work your way up the food chain until you find somebody that does. That is a fax form that they can send you in about 20 or 30 minutes, and it's a temporary registration good for 90 days. Throw that in your airplane, you're good to go. You can fly on that. And if you get ramp checked, you won't have a problem. Yes? Can we check that registration next door? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Good point. They're right around the corner out here. You can check it with them. And, uh, and anybody that has access to the Internet, go to FA.gov. You'll find that information there. Thank you. I appreciate that. So very important, very important to understand that uh, the registration must be valid and that the status of your airworthiness certificate is the same as the status of your registration. I want to talk a little bit about Part 21. I'm not going to go into very, good, very much detail here, but I want you to know what's there. I'm going to cover a couple of titles of different sections so you have an idea of what is, what is in this particular section. Subpart B and Part 21 is titled Certification Procedures for Products and Parts. Subpart B covers type certificates. I mentioned that earlier, where every aircraft, every aircraft that's owned by you has a type certificate. If it's a type certificated aircraft, if it's a light sport, it doesn't have one of these. If it's an experimental amateur built, it doesn't have one of these. But if it's a standard normal type certificated aircraft, it will have a type certificate. And what you would do, let's say you're a manufacturer and you design and build an airplane and you demonstrate to the FAA that that aircraft meets all of the certification rules contained in the FARs. The FAA has the authority, based on Part 21, Subpart B, to issue that type certificate. So you now, as a manufacturer, have a type certificate for that aircraft. Subpart E covers supplemental type certificates. That's something I dealt a lot with at, uh, at WIP Air. They have lots and lots of STCs, and that is the section that authorizes the FAA to issue supplemental type certificates approved data for an alteration. Production certificates. Let's say you are a manufacturer and you design and build an airplane and you demonstrate to the FAA that it meets all of the certification rules you get a type certificate. Can you start making that airplane at that point in time? Nope. You need to establish production and demonstrate that every airplane coming out the end of that production line meets the type design of the aircraft. When you do that, you get a production certificate and you can start making that, it, making that aircraft. Subpart G gives the FAA the authority to issue production certificates. And now, Subpart H, airworthiness certificates. This is the section that grants the FAA the authority to issue that airworthiness certificate. And there's a lot of different kinds and varieties, standard normal and, uh, and experimental, et cetera, et cetera. Subpart O, technical standard order authorizations. And time permitting, towards the end of this presentation, I'm going to run through that, tell you what a TSO is, where it came from, how it came to be and uh, a little bit about that, but there's a lot more to this rule uh, and a lot of it that really you're not going to be interested in, but just to give you an idea, again, 
The legislation that created the FAA gave us the authority to write these rules. These are the rules that grant us the authority to do these things. And uh, we're going to go on now to part 43. This is the rule that I worked under for over 20 years in industry as a mechanic. And there's three parts of this rule that you need to know about. It's a very short rule. It's about a dozen rules and six appendices. It doesn't take very long to read. If you're suffering from insomnia one night, you can pull this out and it'll put you right to sleep. But um, there's three parts of this rule that you really need to know about and are going to be referenced in part 91 that we're going to be talking about here in just a minute. Section 43.5, and I only have the title here, Approval for Return to Service After Maintenance, Preventive Maintenance, Rebuilding, or Alteration. What you need to know about this rule is any time a maintenance function is performed on your aircraft, it must be approved for return to service. It doesn't matter if your mechanic just completed the annual inspection or you just changed the oil. Any time a maintenance function is performed, it must be approved for return to service. So what does an approval for return to service look like? Section 43.9 covers content form and disposition of maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding, and alteration records. There's four things that make up a valid approval for return to service following a maintenance function. Anybody tell me what they are? There's going to be the date, description of the work performed, signature of the person performing the work, and their number. If it was an annual inspection, it's going to be the, the ANPIA or the repair station and their number. If it's an oil change, something that you just did, it's going to be your name and your number, your pilot certificate number that you have under Part 61. It must be approved for return to service. There's one thing that was missing from that list. Anybody know what that was? Time. Times. Thank you. That's not required by the rule under maintenance functions. It is required under inspections. Are you going to put it in? Sure. Absolutely. Always. I always did. I did thousands of maintenance record entries uh, for, as, as chief inspector, and I always referenced the times. Under section 43.11, and you're going to see these referenced in 91 here again in a little bit, this is content, form, and disposition of records for inspections. And this is where all of the time life items, aircraft total time, engine total time, prop total time, time since major overhaul, those times, if there's any life limited parts, if you have an aircraft with a turbine engine in it or a helicopter, there's lots of life limited parts that go into these aircraft parts and pieces. These must be tracked and must be current and up to date at the time an inspection is performed. Okay? I'm going to go into part 91 now. General operating and flight rules is the title of part 91. We are going to be talking about subpart E or what I call the 400 series of the rule and this is titled maintenance, preventive maintenance and alterations. First one we're going to talk about is 14 CFR Part 91, Section 91.403. And paragraph A states the owner or operator, and that would be you, anytime you see owner or operator, that is the pilot of the aircraft, or owner, operator of the aircraft, and that's you, is primarily responsible for maintaining that aircraft in an airworthy condition, including compliance with Part 39 of this chapter. What's part 39? Any guesses? Anybody know? 39 is ADs, Airworthiness Directives. Part 39 is not referenced on the Airworthiness Certificate, but it is incorporated by reference in part 91, section uh, 403A. So this is, this is a great indication of the tentacles, as I describe them, running through the rules where even though the source, which is the airworthiness certificate, doesn't tell you you need to comply with ADs, you do because it's in reference, it's referenced in accordance with Part 91. Next rule we're going to talk about is 91.405. Each owner or operator, and that's you, of an aircraft, shall have that aircraft inspected as prescribed in subpart E of this part, etc., and shall ensure that maintenance personnel make appropriate entries in the aircraft maintenance records indicating that the aircraft has been approved for return to service. Did you just see what the rule just did? Who's responsible to make sure that I make a maintenance record entry for your aircraft, the work I just did on your airplane? You are. How many of you knew that? 
there was a, uh, we had completed a float install, uh, which we did routinely, uh, constantly, and delivered the aircraft. It was completed. We went through all our final checks. It was a proof of return to service. We did everything that we, did, that we normally do for, a, for an install on an aircraft. Owner comes up, jumps in the airplane, <laughs> flies home. He was local, Minneapolis area. Two days later, showed back up with his log book in his hand and said, I don't see a maintenance record entry in here for my float install. And uh, it was a little late at that point in time, but it was there. It was one of those log books, and you may have one like this, that's got different sections in it. It's got an avionics section in it, it's got an alteration section in it, it's got uh, you know, a number of, even though it's in a book that's only that thick, it's got five or six different sections in it. And he didn't look in the right section. I opened it up and showed it to him, and it was there. But he was, uh, he's on the hook for that. You're on the hook for that. The owner-operator is responsible to make sure that your mechanic or repair uh, station gets that work done. And it's a proof of return to service before you get in it and go anywhere. Next one, 91.407A. No person may operate any aircraft that has undergone maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding, or alteration unless it has been approved for return to service by a person authorized, et cetera, et cetera, and the maintenance record entry required by 43.9 or 43.11 as applicable of this chapter has been made. Have we drilled this one into the dirt, into the dirt yet? Why is this so important? Why is the FAA so adamant about this? Anybody have any idea? The answer to this question is one word. Safety. Nope. He said safety. That's always, that's the first, and thank you for that because that's the first answer I always get. Uh, it plays into it, but really I'm thinking about the actual nuts and bolts of why this is so important. And before I answer this, let me ask you another question. I love asking this question because it, it's going to show me who's got animosity towards the FAA. What is... The primary, the, the, the primary responsibility of the FAA. This is going to give you some insight into my thinking and how I think. And it's not job security, and it's not to complicate and make your life miserable. The number one responsibility of the FAA is to find and fix unsafe conditions in the aviation industry. That's my definition. That's what I think we do. So the answer to this question is traceability. How can we fix something if we can't find it? I've got a scenario for you, and, I'll, and this is going to illustrate why this is so important. Let's say, hypothetical situation, you are an instrument rated pilot, and you have a beautiful airplane that's instrument equipped, got all the bells and whistles. All of a sudden, one day, your artificial horizon goes bad, and you need a new one. So you go to your mechanic, and they order one, and they install the new one. Unbeknownst to the manufacturer, unbeknownst to the mechanic, and unbeknownst to you, there is a flaw that has been built into this part. Two weeks later, you're up flying along, and it's been functioning flawlessly up to this point in time. It's running great. Airplane's running great. You're in the soup. You've done everything the way you're supposed to do it. You're a competent IFR pilot. Engine is pulling like it's supposed to, and we're going from point A to point B, when all of a sudden, that flaw comes to light, and it fails. And before you know it, the autopilot throws you into a violent upset maneuver that you can't recover from. You break out of the clouds at 300 feet in a 70-degree nose-down attitude going 200 miles an hour. 1.03 seconds later, you dig a hole in a cornfield and kill everybody on board the aircraft. How are we now charged with sifting through this smoking hole going to figure out what happened to you? There's more of these out there. We need to find them. If there's no maintenance record entry, if there's no way for us to find this flaw and find out why this thing failed, it's a ticking time bomb for somebody else. Maintenance records are vital. Vital in accident investigations and finding causes to accidents the real cause. We don't want to blame the pilot if it's not the pilot's responsibility. We want to find the part. We want to know why this happened. We investigate accidents to prevent future accidents. That's what it's all about. And that's why you see this over and over and over again. Not only am I charged as a mechanic to approve this work for return to service, 
but you are responsible to make sure I do my work. You can't fly it again until it's done, and so there's a record of it, so we can come back to it and find it if we need to. Very important stuff. 91.409, except as provided in paragraph C. Don't you love rules that start like this? Except as provided, now you've got to go figure out what's in paragraph C before you can understand the whole picture, the, the whole scope of this. Except as provided in paragraph C of this section, no person may operate an aircraft unless within the, the preceding 12 months it has had an annual inspection in accordance with part 43 of this chapter or an inspection for the issuance of an airworthiness certificate in accordance with part 21 of this chapter. What do both of these things have in common? What do we need to do before we can issue an airworthiness certificate? Have to make it sure it's airworthy. What do we do if we're going to do an annual inspection? We're making a determination of airworthy. So every 12 calendar months, a determination of airworthy must be made on your aircraft. And there's a bunch of additional rules to Part 91. I'm just going to run through some of these. If you're wondering where they are and really what's in them, I would urge you to, to spend some time in there and to read them. How many of you uh, get your altimeter and uh, altitude reporting equipment tested every 24 calendar months? This is where that comes from. 411 and 413. 413 is transponder test and inspections. I always refer to these as the IFR certs. Anytime an aircraft came in for an annual inspection, as chief inspector, I would pour through the books. I'd do the AD research. I would look for these. And if these were overdue or coming due soon, that's one of the things that I would make sure was done. I'd get with our avionics shop and get that squared away. 91.415 is changes to aircraft inspection programs. I would have wagered to guess that everyone here really is under an annual inspection, and that's not an inspection program. This would be like a phase card inspection or some sort of uh, program established by the manufacturer. If you're going to change from that to something else, this tells you how to do that. 417 is maintenance records retention, tells you how long you need to keep your records. And how many of you knew that it's in the rule that when you sell your airplane, the records must go with it? That's in 91419. Four, uh, 421, rebuilt engine maintenance records, tells you how, uh, how to deal with these and what you need to, for those. So that's essentially part 91 and the sections that apply to you maintenance-wise. I would urge you to go in there if you're interested to read up on some of this stuff. Again, it's pretty dry, but worth your while, I think. I want to talk about 39 for a second because it, uh, I mentioned it earlier, and it is incorporated by reference, and you must comply with ADs. And I wanted to uh, cover just one section in here. It's section 39.7. And uh, when they rewrote this rule several years ago, and maybe it's getting to be longer than that, I don't know. It's, uh, I've earned every single one of these gray hairs on my head, so I am sort of lose track of time. They started each section with a question. And this is how it goes. What is the legal effect of failing to comply with an airworthiness directive? Answer. Anyone who operates a product that does not meet the requirements of an applicable AD is in violation of this section. Strong language, but uh, that's one of the things that also happens during the course of an annual inspection. You should have a complete list of all the ADs that are applicable, applicable to your aircraft and their status. A lot of times I would see, and I'm probably guilty of this at some point until I figured out I wasn't supposed to be doing it, a lot of times what you'll find in the maintenance record entry is, is uh, the mechanic will write in there, checked all ADs, or all ADs up to date. There's a lot of ADs out there that don't apply to your airplane. So we just need to know what the status of the applicable ADs are on your aircraft. Any questions on that section? There's a number of ways you can deal with that. And the question is, what do you do uh, uh, when you can't get your annual inspection done in that 12 calendar month time frame? Yeah. And it happens a lot. And that was one of the things that I did a lot as a, as a principal in the FISDO was issue a what's called a ferry permit. And a ferry permit is a temporary flight authorization that allows you to relocate the aircraft from wherever it is to wherever it needs to go to get that annual inspection done. So, and that's a very easy thing to do, again, as long as your registration is valid. I issued these routinely from, you know, several a week many times. 
And uh, that, again, you need that. It, I, as much as I hate to admit it, the FAA's teeth are rather dull. Unless you're a professional pilot earning a living with your certificate, or a professional mechanic earning a living with your certificate, and a, and a violation or a suspension or a revocation would ruin your career, there really isn't much that, that I'm going to be able to do to you. However, where, who does put the teeth in our rules? It's the insurance companies and the lawyers. You need to have an airworthy aircraft, or at least something that says you have authorization to fly your aircraft when it's not airworthy. Because if something happens from point A to point B, and you're out of annual, and you didn't call for that ferry permit, and something happens, what's your insurance company going to do? Okay, there we go. Let's say uh, I own an airplane and I'm in the military and I'm overseas for a year mm -hmm. or eight months, Air Force Reserve, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got a nice airplane at the home airport sitting in the hangar, but uh, that 12 months rolls through and I'm still overseas. Uh, and so when I come back, I want to go fly my airplane, I get it inspected. But I've done this outside of the 12 month window. Once you complete your annual inspection, you're good to go. The aircraft has been, de been determined to be airworthy and you can fly it. Okay. If, uh, if, if you, and you can arrange for it to be done while you're gone. If it can be done right there at the field. Yeah, if I'm going to be going, pay for an inspection, then I'm not going to use the airplane for another six yeah, months. You, you can, it's uh, painful. You, you don't, there's nothing that says you, if you, you cannot operate the aircraft out of annual. Got it. If you, if you go past that 12 months and you're going to be gone for another eight, and you just want to leave it set, Yeah. well, there you can do that. There's going to be some things that you'd probably want to take care of, like your battery might be an issue, the fuel's going to get old, other issues like that that you're going to want to take care of before you go flying again, but uh, it can sit there. There's yeah. nothing that says it can't sit there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions on this particular segment? We're going to proceed then, I've got time, by the looks of it, into TSOs and PMAs. And there's a lot of confusion, I think, at least that was my experience, and I had questions about TSOs and PMAs, and what they were, where they came from, and how do you get them put on your aircraft. First of all, a TSO is a technical standard order. It is data only. This came about after World War II, late 40s, early 50s, when the aviation industry was really starting to spool up. Everybody was getting involved in aviation, lots of people building airplanes, Everybody that built an airplane, was building an airplane had their own idea of what a seat belt should look like. Everybody had their own idea of what an artificial horizon should look like. Everybody had their own idea of what a turn coordinator should look like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And every single time an aircraft came up for certification, they had to deal with each and every single one of these issues. So the technical standard order came about at that point in time, and it created a set criteria for many different components that were going into aircraft. I'm not sure exactly of the number right now. I looked up the, uh, the TSOs before I came here. This was last week. And the highest number I saw was TSO 198. Now I know there's some that have expired and have gone away, so there's not 198 of them, but there's a lot. Uh, ELTs, uh, seat belts, seats, sump drains, life rafts, life vests, the list goes on and on and on of all of these particular components. For example, a TSO is data only, and if you were to look at the TSO for the ELT, for example, you would find it's only about three or four pages long. It's not very long, but it references a lot of other documents. And one of the paragraphs in there would tell you something like this. This ELT needs to have a G switch that actuates between 4.8 and 5.2 Gs, it must transmit for a period of 48 hours once activated. While transmitting, 80% of its energy must be transmitted between this bandwidth and this bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very technical stuff. If you were a manufacturer that wanted to design an ELT, you would pull this TSO out and say, this is what I need to do. This is how this ELT needs to work. It needs to be able to meet all of these criteria. You would design in, in your ELT. And if it met all of these things, the FAA would issue you a TSO and allow you to start producing that ELT. 
There is no installation authority that comes with a TSO. It is just an FAA approved part. I'm going to talk a little more about that in just a second. Then you have PMAs. A PMA stands for a part, part manufacturing approval. Normally what you would find these on are direct replacement parts. Any Cessna owners here? Own a Cessna? The, uh, the, the example that I like to use here is the seat rails. There's an AD that applies to the seat rails on your Cessna. It's due every 12 calendar months, every annual inspection or a certain number of hours, depending on how many hours you fly. You have to perform this AD. It is an inspection of the seat rails and the seats of your aircraft. And if you find any cracks, anything that's worn beyond limits, that seat rail must be replaced. There are TSO holders out there, I'm sorry, PMA holders out there that can, you can buy a part from them. You either go to Cessna and pay $500 for a seat rail, or you can go to this PMA holder over here and, and spend $200 for a seat rail. What are you going to do? You know, it's a good part. It's, it's a FAA approved part. It's a PMA part. What you're going to find is that that replacement part is specific to your aircraft by make and model and will be accompanied by what's called an AML or an approved model listing. It'll be a piece of paper that comes with that part that tells you what you can put it on. If you have a 172N and you look at this AML and it's got every single 172 ever made since the dawn of time but the 172N, can you put it on your airplane? No. It must be your aircraft by model, number and letter specific, has to be identified on the AML for you to put it on. That is your installation approval. The installation of that seat rail is still a major repair and must be dealt with in a, you have to file a 337 for that repair, but uh, you can put that PMA part in under that AML. That AML is your installation approval for a PMA part. Installation of a TSO part. If the installation of a TSO part is a major alteration, it will require approved data to get it put on your aircraft. If the installation of that TSO part is a minor alteration, you can install it with a logbook. How do you tell the difference? Talk to your mechanic. There are very specific, well, I've talked on this subject for maintenance folks. There's a number of tools we have to determine if a, a repair or alteration to your aircraft is major or minor. Not an exact science, but it's all the help we have and they can apply these tools to what you want to do and to the part you have. And if the TSO, if installation of that TSO part is a major alteration, you need to get some form of approved data. A number of ways you can do that, you can get a field approval. And I know there was a question in here at a forum the other day about the field approval process and why it had gone away and I can tell you from personal experience, uh, I did a lot of them in industry and in the early 2000s, I think it was 2001 or 2002, the guidance changed big time. I was still a, a chief inspector at that time and for, for all practical purposes, as far as I was concerned, field approvals went away. I wasn't doing any of them. They weren't worth my time. And the public cried out as justifiably so and it changed. The guidance changed. And I will tell you now, as a former principal and somebody that did field approvals, that there is no such thing as a dead end. Field approvals are doable. You can do anything to your aircraft. All it takes is time and money. But uh, field approvals will never go away because you won't let them go away. And uh, there's always a way to get it installed on your aircraft. However, there's going to be times when a field approval, a straight up field approval is not, process, is not, is not possible. You can then go to what's called a DER designated engineering representative. They work on behalf of the FAA on the engineering side. They can provide what's called an 8110. That is an engineering authorization. They can justify the part that you're trying to install, provide you with all of the data, and a form that says here, install it in accordance with this. And that can get it installed on your aircraft. So there's a number of ways to get a TSO part that requires, that is a major alteration installed on your aircraft, but you need approved data to be able to do that. So that's the gist of those two things. And I'll give you an example. One of the, the examples that I use in the maintenance side of it, I was talking at the Great Lakes International Aviation Conference in Novi, Michigan back in January, I believe it was. 
And I talked about this, and there was a, a particular case, and we worked a lot on caravans. Caravan was a, big, it was a big aircraft and something that we worked on a lot. We did a lot of alterations to it. We had a lot of exclusive clientele that didn't like the factory seating. They wanted to have the factory seating removed, and they wanted to have the big captain's chairs put in, the Erta captain's chairs or something on that line. And that seat that we were buying for installation in the caravan was a TSO'd seat. But the installation of that seat was a major alteration. We had to get approved data to get that seat into that aircraft. We hired the, the services of a DER who crunched the numbers for us, and I'm not sure, it's something that, that the engineers do, and they come up with all of the data and the numbers to support this, and provided us with an 8110-3 for the installation of these seats. So there's always a way. Don't ever, get, don't ever feel there's a dead end. There's always a way to get a part installed, especially if it's a good part, a TSO'd part. Any questions on that section? Anything on approved parts, uh, PMA parts, or TSO'd parts? I think we're running good on time. Last section, and I'm glad you guys are here. This is the section I alluded to earlier where it's a personal note for me to the audience and the one that my supervisor wanted to have explained to her before she'd let me do it. As you know, I spent over 20 years in industry working hard every day just trying to do it right. Reading the rules, interpreting the rules, trying to work within the confines of those rules. Same thing you're doing. I don't think there's anybody out there that wants to fly unsafe and are just looking for that information to, to make their lives better and safer. And then when I crossed over to the dark side and went to work for the FAA, my roles changed. I went from working under these rules to trying to explain these rules. Phone would ring, somebody had a question, can you tell me about this rule, how do we do this, what does it mean? And uh, for a period of time, I was in the, a big learning curve, trying to figure out and learn for myself the rules that I was expected to enforce. And one day, it dawned on me what the rules were it was an epiphany, if you will, and I want to share this with you by asking you two questions. First question, why do we have the FARs? And if you think back to the other questions I've asked you about what is the number one responsibility of the FAA, these, this is from me again. This is from my heart. Why do we have the FARs? You can throw out an answer if you'd like. I get lots of answers. Usually safety is one of them. Job security for the FAA is one of them. Other issues like that, but I'm serious. Why do we have the FARs? Why do they exist? My answer to this question is the FARs exist to protect you from yourself. Okay, so if that's what they are, I'm sorry, if that's why we have them, then what are they? What are the FARs? And usually I have, uh, you can hear pin drop at this point. They've heard the answer to the first one, figured it's hopeless, guessing for the second one. Um, but this was my epiphany. But not the first question, but the second question, this one right here. One day it just, it, it dawned on me. It's like the light bulb went on. What are they? The FARs are lessons learned. Since the dawn of its inception, from the CAA to the FAA, we have been a reactionary entity. We investigate accidents, we investigate things that break, we investigate things that go wrong, and if enough people die, a rule changes. This is a hundred years of lessons learned is what you find in the rules. I would ask all of you to please look at them in this light and learn from the mistakes of others. You will not live long enough to learn them all yourself. I went to a rotorcraft accident investigation class a couple of years ago, best class I've ever been to, hosted by Bell Helicopters down in Fort Worth, Texas. Virtually every rotorcraft manufacturer was there, and all of the instructors were outstanding. They were industry accident investigators from those companies. All of them had anywhere from 20 to 40 years of experience. Outstanding instructor corps. There were two things that came out of this that really struck me. And a couple of days before the class ended, 
we had a big meeting at our hotel, and this was a who's who in rotorcraft accident investigation. All of the students were there. Bell Helicopters was there. Eurocopter was there. Sikorsky was there. NTSB was there. Frank Del Gandio, Office of Accident Investigation, Washington, D.C., FAA was there. Anybody at an official level and in an official capacity that investigates rotorcraft accidents was there. And before this was over, I raised my hand. I wanted to get my two cents worth in. And I wanted to, uh, to ask this group. There was no better opportunity than right now. Raised my hand and I brought up these two things that came up during the course of this class. Number one was a slide that was put up by Roy Fox, engineer at Bell, been there 40 years, heads up their flight safety department. One of the slides that he put up during his presentation was a pie chart, and we've all seen these. We've all seen pie charts depicting this, that, or the other thing. And this one depicted the causal factors for rotorcraft accidents. 63% of the pie was pilot error, 15% was parts, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing to note is that he put this chart together 15 years ago, and it's still true today. The numbers haven't changed. The numbers, total numbers, go up and go down and have been steadily trending down lately, but the percentages haven't changed. And the other slide that came up that was really the quintessential slide for me and the one that got me started off on this line of thought that I brought into the National Landing Gear Failure PowerPoint project that I was involved with and some products, some educational products I have since developed for the maintenance side of the house. But the title of the slide was, There Are No New Accidents, which is very true. Every time an airplane crashes and kills someone, they've just killed themselves the same way someone else before them has and someone else before them has and someone else before them has. So the question I have for you is the same question that I put out at this big meeting. Why is our industry not learning from their mistakes? What are we doing wrong? What aren't we doing right? What can we do different to change this? Food for thought. Again, I don't think there's anybody out there that wants to fly unsafe. Everybody wants to fly safe in this business. Nobody wants to hurt anyone. Nobody wants to hurt themselves. An interesting statistic, and again, about the rules. This all focuses on the rules and what they are and the lessons we've learned from them. If you are involved in an accident with your aircraft and if you are in violation of a rule at the time of that accident, you are four times more likely to die or to kill someone. The, lessons, uh, the, the rules are there to protect you. And even though, regardless of what you think of them, regardless of how they're interpreted, regardless of your, your intimate dealings or your face-to-face -face dealings with the FAA, these are what the rules are. Take this information and, and you know, put it to heart. And that the rules are there really for a reason. There's minimum safe altitudes for a reason. You need to have a medical certificate as a pilot for a reason. I need to have certain training for an A&P for a reason. All of the rules are there because we've learned a lesson along the way that tells us we needed to do this. So that's my special note to you. Again, my name is Jim Niehoff. I am the Airworthiness Fast Team Program Manager for Minnesota. This is my contact information. If you have any questions and you'd like to talk to me about this or anything else, I'm available. My email address is here. It's james.niehoff at faa.gov. I'm at the Minneapolis FISDO. There's the address. And uh, if you have any questions, now's the time. Yes. Very good question, and uh, it's about an antique aircraft that you can't find parts for anymore. There are rules that allow an owner to produce their own parts. You must, however, have something to go by. You need some data. You need to be able to reverse engineer. You need some means to determine what you have. But you as an owner do have the right under the rule, and I, I'm not prepared really to talk to at length about this, but there is a rule in place that allows you as the owner of the aircraft to produce that part. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the follow-on is when you sell the airplane, what happens? 
Well, it's a, it was a legal part built by you under the rule and installed into the part. Now, I, don't, I can't answer it for any liability concerns, if that's your question. Um, what happens, what, what's your responsibility for that part once you sell the aircraft and it moves on to a new owner? Uh, you, uh, under the rule, have manufactured that part, installed that part. The aircraft uh, subsequently goes under, uh, is determined to be airworthy each, cal each 12 calendar months. Um, it's still an airworthy, airworthy aircraft with that part on it. But liability-wise, what, uh, what are you accepting liability-wise on that part? I, I can't answer that. Um, I do know that as a, uh, uh, as a manufacturer of an experimental amateur-built aircraft, that you are the manufacturer. Your Cessna, your Raytheon, and, and if you sell that aircraft, you accept the same liabilities as any manufacturer does for the life of that aircraft. So, but again, I can't speak directly to the liability issues regarding that part, other than if you build it in accordance with the rule and you can do it under the approved parts uh, or the man owner manufactured parts, and it's a good part, you had good data, it's a good, good material, uh, et cetera, it's a good part and it can be installed and, and sold and resold with the aircraft. All right? Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Interesting okay. parts, Dave, right here. We're still on camera. Okay. Interesting about all those various parts that we can check and double check on. And of course, you mentioned the fact that when you get an annual inspection, it's still the owner operator's responsibility to make sure the airplane is still airworthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of, a lot of pilots, I don't think, realize their responsibilities on this end of the spectrum. The, uh, their responsibilities they accept as the owner and operator for the maintenance of their aircraft. Got any more questions of the presenter? You can come right up here. Come right up here, sir. Uh, 